Good morning. It's great to uh, see all of you uh, gathered here in our rooms, in our rooms around uh, Southeast and certainly online. I appreciate so much you uh, uh, joining us and being together. Um, obviously, uh, there is a lot going on um, in our country and by uh, its implication in our own personal lives with all the events of last week. There are a lot of things uh, that I would prefer to talk about um, today, like maybe college football, Roll Tide, or something like that. Um, but um, I think it is incredibly pointed that this series that we have had planned for some time would be falling um, on this Sunday, a series I'm talking about together. And, uh, you know, as I've wrestled with, you know, obviously been writing on this for a while, uh, the trajectory or the, the way today is going to go is different than it was intended to go uh, because of the events of uh, this past week. And so, you know, in all honesty, um, I'm just going to kind of share sort of where I'm at. I'm going to put all my cards on the table, and uh, hopefully, eventually, it'll give you the freedom to do the same, and then together, we'll begin to understand or see maybe more fully what it is that God is calling us to. I think this is an absolutely pointed time for the church. It is an opportunity for the church. It is so unbelievably pointed But it's not going to happen if we dig in and we try to do what we've always done. Instead, we're going to have to ask God, and and in his grace, he gives us something, and he avails something to us to cause us to see things differently. And I think that's where the hope is for you and for me, and ultimately, I think that is the hope for our world. Um, One of the things, our mission is to reach people and help them walk with God. We've been doing this for 21 years. We've been consistently, that's everything that we do is to sort of how we extend a hand to you, where you are, and help you take steps with him and towards him. That's always been our charge. A few years ago, um, we were wrestling with what does it look like when we help someone walk with God? What should happen if you walk with God and I walk with God? What does that look like? And so we began to really wrestle with this sort of idea. What is, our, what is the vision of this church. What do we, and so we worked, I mean, for probably a year and a half, I went in like to, you know, kind of a room. I did like sweatshops, did all kinds of things to try to figure out, God, what are you, what are you calling us to become? What are we supposed to look like? And so we came up with this phrase. And the phrase centers on this word, together, which I think is very interesting because it's the one word that I resisted more than anything else. I love reaching people and helping them walk with God. I love big vision stuff. But this idea tripped me up. But it became the hinge of this vision, which we have said that when we help people, we reach people and help them walk with God. We want them to experience life with God together for the world. We realized we wanted to be the kind of church that was known for what we were for and not just what we were against. We wanted to get really, really clear on how we were going to engage in the God's redemptive promise for this world in which we live and the creation in which we have been entrusted. So this began a long journey. This is, this is probably the culmination or maybe the, the front edge of about the last seven years in my life. And what I want to do is I want to show you up here. We're going to kind of use that as the bigger kind of thing over everything today. But about, I don't know, five or six years ago, I started drawing this this way. I started talking about this this way. I've been very intentionally over the last eight or nine months drawing this on the board frequently, talking about it frequently, because, and if you'll remember, what I wanted us to do is as the election was nearing, this just started back through the pandemic, as the election was nearing, I want us to be able to to endure or to get walked through this season without losing our minds. That was how I talked about this. So I kept drawing this up there. And I said, there are two ways in which we live. One is defined by the patterns of the world. There's the ways of the world that we are all familiar with. We know how they work. We know how to get along in them. We know how to use them for our advantage. And there's another way that is referred to as the kingdom of God. One is governed by the law. Sorry, it's like the Ten Commandments. It's governed by law. It develops systems of fairness and equity and defines problems by we talked about all this. There's another rule in the kingdom of God. 
that is foreign to us, that is unlike this, and it is ruled by love. Now, let me go ahead and tell you, I am a, I grew up in, a, in, in the church, uh, much more of a conservative, what you would consider conservative. I grew up that way. Um, I, I knew the Bible. I knew the commands. I knew all the things. I knew how to blast people in arguments. I've learned all that my whole life. I know how to do it. Um, over the last eight or nine years, to think about what, what, what actually is revealed to us, I grew up thinking that the kingdom of God was the place that I went after I died. Want to go to heaven, you want to go to hell. The kingdom of God is there. Well, of course, that's what Jesus did. The kingdom of God, so that's, I'll, I'll receive him, and then when I die, I'll go to heaven. And then you start reading the Bible, and you start understanding who Jesus is and what he's about, and you realize that the kingdom of God is something that Jesus brought to us, near us. He made it available to us. And I begin to shift how I think about this. What happens? What is this rule of love? So for me to talk about the rule of love, I recognize 30-year-old Mike would have heard someone say, oh, the rule of love, here's this wishy-gishy person up there trying to tell us, can't we all just get along? And what I'm telling you is this sort of, this, this thing that God has made available to us is far more powerful than you and I can even begin, I think, to understand. What happens in this, when we sort of use the law, and this is, and again, I've drawn this over and over again, is you develop these sort of philosophies that are centered around ideologies that are known as conservative or liberal or left and of right. And what has happened historically is the right side says, this is the side that God is on. And now what's beginning to happen is the left side says, no, this is the side that God is on. We line all our issues up and we go, oh my gosh, can't you see how this is God and God is for this. And oh my gosh, can't you see how, or worse, what we say is how can you not see this? Failing to realize that both of these sides are not one side's on the side of God and the other side's on the side that's not God. Both of these are two sides of the exact same system that God has called us out of. You gotta stay with me. You gotta stay with me. Because what I want to do today, I, I have no intention of trying to prove a point. I don't care. Twitter can have that. What I care about, and what I care deeply about is helping us to see. Because I can tell you, if we continue to see what we have always seen, it is going to be more of the same. If you want to be different, I want to be different. I want things to be different. We have got to see something that we haven't yet seen fully or not enough or whatever that might be. These next few weeks are not going to be about sound bites. You're going to have to listen closely, pay attention. There's going to be a lot of nuance in here. I've done a lot of soul searching in this, trying to understand and figure out, God, what is it that you're doing here? Um, you know, uh, to be honest, it, it's so funny. I, over the years, over this last year, um, you know, I've talked a lot about race. And I've gotten some, you know, great emails and very sweet emails and very thoughtful emails. I have friends of mine who are, you know, thick in the middle of, um, you know, experiences where they have been uh, victims of. They, have, you know, all those things. I, I've taught, so I've just gotten really proximate, trying to learn from people that are friends of mine, and hear their stories and ask questions and learn. And in the very same you know, breath, I've gotten people who just can't believe that I would talk about race or whatever. And so I've, I've been on this journey. And the question that I get, and, 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 and in fact, I've gotten you know, people on social media have posted stuff, and, and some of it wasn't directed at me, but sometimes when you see something from someone that you know, you're kind of thinking they're making, like, taking a shot at you. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I remember there were a couple of memes that I saw about uh, another particular issue. And the meme just simply said, if you talk about race, but not about, if, if you're a pastor and you talk about race, but not abortion, you're a fraud. And I've had good friends of mine who've emailed me and said, Mike, why is it you talk about race and not abortion? And so when I read something like that, it says, if you talk about race and not about abortion, you're a fraud. Well, your first response is, oh yeah, I'll show you. And then you realize that I probably should try to figure this out over here and you just look, use it as a mirror. God, is there something to this? A lot of the emails I've gotten from the response that I, we posted on uh, our website and such last week uh, has been 
pretty, pretty far ranging, as you might imagine. You get the usual you know, pot shots and hecklers and such, but there have been some really thoughtful emails. Um, really thoughtful people who, who don't, and, and some felt like they were hurting my feelings and are very apologetic in the way they were writing. And I, I called them or I texted them, and several had multiple phone calls. And I would pick up the phone and call them and have a conversation. They said, Mike, I didn't mean to hurt. I didn't hope. It's like, no, you didn't. This is a healthy conversation. Most of the response has been really, really healthy, and that should be very encouraging to us. But when I began to think about this, these questions of, as I thought about this, because what's interesting to me, that the issue of race seems to be owned by the left, and the issue of abortion seems to be owned by the right, and I think, why do I talk about one and not the other, and do I talk about either? I, I, I'm, I'm learning. This is still a huge learning curve for me and for us as a church. But there are reasons, right? I recognize that when I'm up here and I'm saying things, if I towed all the party lines and you're here or you know someone who's had an abortion, you're going to feel like a hammer hit you and all you're going to feel is shame and guilt. That's not, a, that's, not, that's not of God. That's not what the church does. We bring hope and help and peace and we extend hands to people no matter what you've done. So there is, there is a sensitivity, there's an awareness that what happens from this stage, the way it comes across is perhaps different than a conversation. And as I've been wrestling with this, you know, because I had to do some deep dive, I've been reading about this and writing about this for, for months, trying to legitimately answer the question, why do I feel more comfortable talking about one and not comfortable talking about the other? Or why is one more pressing than the other? Or whatever it might be. And what I began to realize is what's happened is, you know, again, when you look at this, as I began to think about this and just have been writing about this, the root of both of these issues are the exact same. It's the human value and dignity that is given to us and created by God and for him. And how either one of those things can be more important than the other to someone who follows Jesus, that's what I'm trying to wrestle with. These things are both critical. But they're, they're not, we're not gonna, so what happens is we think if we get people together here, the world will be okay. Or if we get people together here, then the world will be okay. And God is calling us to something fundamentally different. So how do we think about this? How do we think about this? Here is how we as followers of Jesus are instructed. I'm gonna read this right out of Ephesians chapter four. And what you've gotta decide is how much allegiance you're going to give to Jesus. If we're gonna live in his kingdom under the rule of God's love, you've gotta decide how much allegiance are you gonna give him. But here's what he says to us. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord, as someone who is in chains, in bondage for the Lord Jesus, I then urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Being completely humble and gentle and patient. Bearing with one another. It's interesting this text was selected for this week about eight weeks ago. What a powerful thing to be reminded of. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to, uh, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and is through all and who is in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ has apportioned us, apportioned it. To each of us, grace has been given just as Christ said. I've read this passage hundreds of times, probably more than that. And it's so funny, what I always see is the tactical applications if he gave pastors and prophets and apostles and teachers. I've never noticed how central Christ's rule is in this. Christ apportions this as he has given it. If we move on down to verse 11, we see this. So Christ himself, out of his rule, out of his kingship, he himself gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in faith and knowledge of the Son of God until everybody gets it, until we all reach it, 
until we all reach unity of the faith, until we all reach the unity and the knowledge of the Son of God, and we become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is the picture. This is the idea and the way in which we're supposed to approach this. The events of last week, I'm not going to make any comments about them other than to say this. I think we have seen over the last little while, but kind of culminated last week, I think we could all agree that we could make the assessment that things are not as they should be. Could we at least agree with that? We look around and go, things just aren't like they ought to be. Things should be different than they are. They're just not like they ought to be, which gives rise to another question. And that natural question that rises is, how then should things be? How should things be? See, the easy work is to talk about how things shouldn't be. The easy work is to take pot shots and to criticize everything that everybody else is doing. Well, it shouldn't be like that, and it shouldn't be like that, and it shouldn't be like that. The hard work is to try and understand, well, how then should it be? And if we're really honest, right, our version of how it should be probably falls somewhere in this spectrum. And we've not really considered what if it were like this? What if it were something completely different and beyond what it is that you and I thought this world should be? And I began to think about how do you develop this? How do you get your default vision of how things should be? Is more than likely what you inherited, what you grew up in, your experiences what your parents taught you, and either you said, I'm gonna do what they did, or I'm gonna do the opposite of what they did. The experience you had in our culture, how did you get to develop your vision of what should be? Everybody says, well, I just, I just look at the facts. Everybody says that. I think it's more than that. It's interesting, I had to do a little deep dive in myself. I told you, I grew up in this, I grew up in this conservative, and again, I don't want to, this is not a right, wrong thing. This is just to be able to understand how did I get to be the way that I am? What are the things that have influenced me? Where did my vision come from? It's not, you know, we, everything doesn't have to be, oh, well, you said this, so you've got to denounce this. It's not that. I'm grateful for my heritage. My parents are wonderful. I had a wonderful church experience. But I grew up in what you would consider maybe more the conservative Christian right. And Christian was always sort of equated just by default as this Republican uh, conservative politics thing. It's just, I didn't know that's how it was. That's just the default. I assume you're familiar with that ideology, how people think like that. And what it was sort of termed is you had sort of the Christian right and then you had the secular humanist left. Y'all probably heard these kind of delineations sort of made. And anything that sniffed at the left was seen as terrible. Anything, if you're on the left, that sniffs of the right is seen as, you know, theocracy or whatever it might be. And so you just create all this, this tension just existed. And when I realized, when I started, this is, again, started years and years and years. This takes a long time to process. But you gotta be willing to enter into this. What I realized was that the vision that I had for the church, what was the role of the church in the world, was almost by default the restoration of a Christian nation. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to as much as a, as a question as it is anything else. Is that what God has in mind? And don't immediately go, yes, and here's how, or no, and here's how. What I've been, what I've been learning, this passage of seek first the kingdom of God From Matthew chapter six, I memorized this as a kid. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Guess why I love that verse as an 18 year old? You know why? Seek first the kingdom of God and guess what? All these things get added unto you. What do I want? The kingdom or all these things added to me? Guess which one it was? I want all these things added unto me. So if I have to seek first the kingdom and then get all these things, well, that's what I'll do. And over years and years and years, and what I realized, that's not what this, what this invitation is about. It's to seek first the kingdom of God because you and I are not likely to see it first. We've got to seek it and pursue it and understand that something else is available to us. Perhaps it is more. It's interesting that what happens inevitably is that our view of Jesus often gets framed by our politics and not the other way around. 
And what I believe the opportunity for the church is, is to really sort of interrupt those places and say, God, we're gonna look for something different. I think this vision that, that sort of I inherited, and again, not in a bad way, that the way in which the church was sort of involved in the culture and the way the, the, the left was involved or the right was involved has sort of given rise to these culture wars. And the current reality of our, of our politics is simply those people are destroying what we have. It is on both sides. This language uh, permeates both parties. It is echoed by most of the media outlets, and then it rips through our social media feeds with great predictability. It is not surprising. When I turned on the news on Thursday night, I watched all networks. I could tell you what they were going to say. Both of them. As much as I want to go, oop, they're right, and oop, they're right, I just realized this is nuts. It's outrage. It's resentment. It's driven by cycles of fear and pride. You're going to take away something from me. You're going to pay me. I mean, it's, it's just all this, this chaos. Trigger patterns to develop things that you're supposed to be outraged about. And if you're not, somehow you don't. And then the culture comes in and says, it's time for us to unify. It's time for us to understand the importance of doing things together. But then they go on current blame tours, or I told you so tours, or my uh, issue is more important than yours tours. And I can tell you all this talk is going to yield little fruit. But this is where I think the hope is. I think the way for us to learn how to live differently and distinctly is so palpable right here in front of us. And the reason these conversations are important is there is a generation of people that are walking away from the church because they go, if that's what it is, that doesn't sound anything like Jesus. We've been having conversations for about four or five years around what does it look like to have Jesus at the center as our king and then everything else be framed by him. And it doesn't diminish this. It actually elevates this. It helps me to see more clearly what's happening in the scriptures, that what Israel wanted what Israel wanted is God's world on their terms. Give us a king like everybody else has a king. And what God was always doing is going, you need a vision bigger than the like every other nation vision that you have. Megan Good's written a book around this and what she says in there, she says, this is a whole entire borderless world that comes truly alive under the rule of God. Could we have a vision for that? I do believe that the church, there is a way for the voice of the church to find influence in the culture, but the church first has to find its voice. I cannot be responsible for what every other Christian or every other church is doing or saying or is not doing or not saying, but what I can be responsible for is what is right in front of me, what God has entrusted me to, and how I'll lead our staff, or my life, our staff, and those who consider Port City their home. And what we've been talking about for the better part of four or five months with the staff is things like this. That what everybody's going to try to do is to take Jesus and make him on one side or the other and say that this issue is more important than that issue. And that both the Christian right, which has historically done this to its own demise, and if the Christian left adopts the same thing, it will happen to them as well. Whenever Christian right or Christian left, Christian gets relegated to an adjective to serve the idol that you're actually trying to build. And Jesus is then trotted out like a mascot to uphold or to give the thumbs up to whatever view you happen to hold. Christianity is this, this is, he's, he's not an adjective, he's a king. And he demands our allegiance. And he's calling us into something much different. Could it be more than what we think? It requires something of us to be governed by love. It's interesting. In the passage that we just read, it says that love is to be marked by patience. Galatia, or, or 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter says love is patient. Do you ever wonder why you have to be reminded that love is patient? Here's what most of us think. God calls me to love and he calls love to be patient because I got to put up with you until you agree with me. And I'm just exercising great love and I just let you remain in your ignorance and just try to convince you slowly but surely. I'm just, just so loving. The picture is a call for us to be long-suffering 
as we work to understand one another, as we work to understand what God's rule of love is really like and its implications on it, these are astounding implications for how we live. Until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. The church has long existed as a place where sworn enemies could gather. Do you realize this actually happens in our current world? There are places in our world, and I'll give you three examples that I know of firsthand. One being in Palestine, Israelis and Palestinians meet as followers of Jesus, both from different religions, both at the threat that if their friends knew, they would consider them abandoning them. And they meet in this place to gather in the name of Jesus, to pray and to look for something more than what they currently see. The world defines them as enemies and they come together in some miraculous community that is framed in the kingdom of God. The church is a place, the gathering, this place where we come together is a place where people who feel no honor can find honor because they are made in the image of God and created with worth and value and dignity and God's love through us breathes breathes that into them. It's a place where people who are racked with shame can find acceptance, where those who are crushed under guilt can find freedom. Make no mistake about it, the kingdom of God is ruled by love and it is reconciled by forgiveness. I think we overlook this because we think that somehow we're going to write the score on either side. It is never going to happen. If you're going to live in the kingdom, it's going to be because we live as those who have been forgiven and we forgive as we have been forgiven. That is a distinction of what it means to follow Christ. And what that means is you release people from whatever you think they owe you. This is the only way for these kind of relationships that we're made for can actually begin to thrive. But it's interesting to me when I thought this, I think this is sort of God's sense of humor. Life with God together for the world. Life with God I love. Life with God, me and my relationship with Jesus, me and my personal quiet. Y'all, I'm big on quiet time journaling. Y'all know that, right? Be responsible for your walk. Personal responsibility. I love that. Doesn't that sound like the right? That's like their hallmark. For the world. Sounds like social justice. Sounds like caring for the poor and the widows and issues like race. I went to seminary. I, I dropped out. I left after a couple of years. I was told in seminary that the social gospel was dangerous because it was a threat to the real gospel. That's nowhere to be found in the way of Jesus. It's really interesting that in our mission, we didn't even know this, you get kind of both of these things and it's hinged on the most difficult part of this is our capacity to do things together, to do them both. I want to make no mistake about this. This is not just about sort of gathering a bunch of humanitarians together to do humanitarian causes. It's not to try to put some people together who have some things in common to work for the better of our world. That's not it. What, this is framed very concisely in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, uh, verses 1 through 4. And it says this, That which we have heard from the beginning, which we have heard, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes and which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared or the life was made manifest in Jesus and we have seen it and we testify uh, testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has now appeared to us in the life of his Son. That's what he's talking about. And then he says this in verse three. We proclaim to you that which we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. But make no mistake about it, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What he's saying is this, we we long for you to be a part, but make no mistake about it, our relationship, our koinonia, our shared common life is that with the Father, shares with the Son, we share with him, and we are inviting you into that. 
It's about you and your relationship with Christ so that we do your life with God together, my life with God together becomes an expression, a force in the world around us. There are three things I want to mention about together. I want to give you two statements and then I'll be done. I've got way too much. Number one, together, and this is why this is this is the hardest thing about this. Everybody loves to gather until you actually have to be together. Then it's kind of a pain. Together is available all the time. It's available all the time. Anytime two human beings connect with one another in any capacity, the opportunity to be together is available. Number two, together is accessible to everyone. The church has long talked about community. We're going to talk about this next week. But the church has long talked about community. What we say is things like this, that life change happens best in small groups. Or life change, if you, if you join a small group, you'll get in community. And you show up to a small group, you're like, dude, not only is this not community, I don't even like these people. And you never go back. Or you go and it's like, you, and, you, and it's just like, you, and your life has not changed. You go, well, that doesn't work. And you can just blame everybody else for why you're no different than you are. Life with God together means you got to show up. It means there's an accessibility. Everybody has access to this. But togetherness always has a trajectory. It always has a trajectory. Every single interaction that you have with another person has a potential. It sets a direction. It means something to what's happening in and around you. Every interaction. When we gather, whether it's in this format, online, for coffee and lunches in our houses, however we do it, there's the potential to heal, there's the potential to harm, there's the potential to value someone or to undermine them. We know that together, right? We know that together can be benign, doesn't really mean anything. Together can be shallow. Together can be toxic. Together can be harmful. We used to call this peer pressure when I was growing up. Your mom would say, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you, right? We had all this stuff. But together can also be healthy, even when you disagree. Together can be encouraging. It can be sharpening. It can be shaping. To think that I have a bunch of yes people around me is to fool yourselves. I have people who push really hard on all the things that we talk about and do and wrestle and who I'm becoming and who they're becoming. Together, you can share burdens and you can celebrate successes. Sometimes togetherness becomes life sustaining and life-giving. We're going to talk more about that. But togetherness always has potential, but what it requires is it requires for someone to be responsible for what happens when you're together. And what I'm going to tell you is that responsibility is on you. It is on me. I am responsible for the trajectory of every point of togetherness that I engage in. I'm responsible. As a follower of Christ and to be humble and gentle, to abound in love, to seek first his kingdom, to see what God's, those are, those are the things. If I'm going to claim allegiance to Christ, that's how I have to participate in this. And it is my responsibility to do that. And so what I want us to do today as we close out, and again, I'm going to have to just stop where I'm at. We'll continue this next week. But I want to give you two statements that I want you to consider. Number one is I want you to determine to take responsibility for what happens when you are together with other people. And it's not a, oh, I'll do that. It's, it, is a, it is a gut check. You'll walk out of here today and someone will say something to you about what happened last weekend. You're gonna go off the rails. You're gonna see a comment. And you're gonna go off the rails. And you're gonna treat other people based, you, I want to determine, this is how I'm going to take responsibility for what happens for the trajectory of things. Is it moving toward community, toward wholeness, toward life giving and life exchange? To determine, and you're gonna to have to just kind of work on this over the next couple of weeks, months, years. And the second one is this. I want to invite you to determine to seek first the kingdom of God, even if it is at the expense of your own.
We've built these very carefully. We've built them with a lot of information. We've inherited them from a perspective that is generations old. What if there's something more? What if there's something more? Would you want to miss it? I know there are reasons why we don't want to let go of this. I, I know firsthand. The things that I want to preach on are not always the things I do preach on. I have a lot of stuff in my tool belt. I, I, I want to be responsible with what God is asking of us, and I've committed to this as well. It's taken me the better part of five years to begin to undo some of the things that I've held to recognize that, oh my gosh, there's something more. There's something more. Would you be willing to seek first his kingdom in such a way that it frames everything else? So here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna sit quietly. If you're watching online, just get, take a seat. Maybe you're already sitting down or if you're standing up because you're bored and you're getting your fourth cup of coffee or whatever, just take a seat. I want you to just open your hands. Actually, close them first. Close them tight. Squeeze them. This is the fierceness with which we hold on to things. Some of these positions that we have inherited are, are as though they are directly from God. Some of them are things that if we let go of it, we will be, we're afraid we'll be taken advantage of. We're afraid that we won't actually get what we want. And so when you feel it, just squeeze tighter. And know that the more you feel that direction, the more you're going to be pulled into the patterns that you are most familiar with. Then I want you to hear Jesus invite you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be taken care of. And then let your grip relax and maybe open your fingers. Father, here you are. I'm open-handed with things that I really don't necessarily want to be open-handed about. I don't want to be open-minded just so I can be, you know, cool in the culture or hit with what's going on. I want to be open-minded so that my heart might be transformed more fully into your image. That's what I want. I don't want to hold on to things that prevent that. Father, I want to just confess from my perspective that I have sometimes not looked hard enough for your kingdom because I've been very content with the one that I can build here. And yet you continually defy that. And I'm thankful that you do. God, that you would keep us hungry and you would keep us thirsty for who you are and what you long for in this world. For your truth and for your grace, for your justice and for your mercy. God, that we would seek you first, your kingdom first, and that in your incredible grace, you would reveal to us what it looks like and how we can walk in it, that together, that together, we become the light and the salt and the leaven that lights and quickens and affects every part of our culture. God, let us find our voice as we find your heart. And I lift all the same of your son, Jesus. Amen.